Welcome to Tom Reads Books, the podcast where, whatever you're doing, I take you on an adventure through some of literature's most loved treasures. If you do enjoy the podcast, make sure to subscribe so that you never miss an episode, and also check out the Patreon at patreon.com slash tomreadsbooks, where I release two exclusive episodes every week of a completely different book, full audiobook versions of all books read, and you can help choose future books for me to read. Now, though, I'd like to invite you to settle in. Relax. And let me tell you a story. Alice's Adventures in Wonderland Written by Lewis Carroll Continuing Chapter 9 The Mock Turtle's Story All the time they were playing, the queen never left off quarrelling with the other players and shouting, Off with his head! or Off with her head! Those whom she sentenced were taken into custody by the soldiers, who, of course, had to leave off being archers to do this, so that by the end of half an hour or so, there were no archers left, and all the players except the king, the queen, and Alice were in custody and under sentence of execution. Then the queen left off quite out of breath, and said to Alice, "'Have you seen the Mock Turtle yet?' "'No,' said Alice. "'I don't even know what a Mock Turtle is.' "'It's the thing Mock Turtle soup is made from,' said the Queen. "'I never saw one or heard of one,' said Alice. "'Come on, then,' said the Queen, "'and he shall tell you his history.' As they walked off together, Alice heard the King say in a low voice to the company generally, "'You are all pardoned.' Come, that's a good thing, said Alice to herself, for she had felt quite unhappy at the number of executions the Queen had ordered. They very soon came upon a griffin, lying fast asleep in the sun. Up, lazy thing, said the Queen, and take this young lady to see the mock turtle and to hear his history. I must go back and see after some executions I have ordered. And she walked off, leaving Alice alone with the griffin. Alice did not quite like the look of the creature, But on the whole she thought it would be quite as safe to stay with it as to go after the savage queen, so she waited. The griffin sat up and rubbed its eyes. Then it watched the queen till she was out of sight. Then it chuckled. (laughs) What fun, said the griffin, half to itself, half to Alice. What is the fun, said Alice. Why, she, said the griffin. It's all her fancy, that. They never executes nobody, you know. Come on. Everybody says come on here, thought Alice, as she went slowly after it. I never was so ordered about before in all my life, never. They had not gone far before they saw the mock turtle in the distance, sitting sadly and lonely on a little ledge of rock, and as they came nearer, Alice could hear him sighing, as if his heart would break. She pitied him deeply. What is his sorrow? she asked the griffin, and the griffin answered, very nearly in the same words as before. It's all his fancy that he hasn't got no sorrow, you know. Come on. So they went up to the mock turtle, who looked at them with large eyes full of tears, but said nothing. This here young lady, said the griffin, she wants to know your history, she do. I will tell it to her, said the mock turtle in a deep, hollow tone, "'Sit down, both of you, and don't speak a word until I have finished.' So they sat down, and nobody spoke for some minutes. Alice thought to herself, "'I don't see how he can ever finish if he doesn't begin.' But she waited patiently. "'Once,' said the Mock Turtle at last with a deep sigh, "'I was a real turtle.' These words were followed by a very long silence, broken only by an occasional exclamation of Hitchcra, 
and the constant heavy sobbing of the mock turtle. Alice was very nearly getting up and saying, Thank you, sir, for your interesting story. But she could not help thinking there must be more to come, so she sat still and said nothing. When we were little, the mock turtle went on at last, more calmly, though still sobbing a little now and then, we went to school in the sea. The master was an old turtle. We used to call him Tortoise. Why did you call him Tortoise, if he wasn't one? Alice asked. We called him Tortoise because he taught us, said the mock turtle angrily. Really, you are dull. You ought to be ashamed of yourself for asking such a simple question, added the griffin, and they both sat silent and looked at poor Alice, who felt ready to sink into the earth. At last, the griffin said to the mock turtle, Drive on, old fellow. Don't be all day about it. And he went on in these words. Yes, we went to school in the sea, though you mayn't believe it. I never said I didn't, interrupted Alice. You did, said the mock turtle. Hold your tongue, added the griffin, before Alice could speak again. The mock turtle went on. We had the best of educations. In fact, we went to school every day. I've been to a day school too, said Alice. You needn't be so proud as all that. With extras? asked the mock turtle, a little anxious. Yes, said Alice. We learnt French and music. And washing? said the mock turtle. Certainly not, said Alice indignantly. Ah, then yours wasn't a really good school, said the mock turtle in a tone of great relief. Now, at ours, they had, at the end of the bill, French, music, and washing extra. You couldn't have wanted it much, said Alice, living at the bottom of the sea. I couldn't afford to learn it, said the mock turtle with a sigh. I only took the regular course. What was that? inquired Alice. Reeling and writhing, of course, to begin with, the mock turtle replied, and then the difficult branches of arithmetic. Ambition, distraction, uglification, and derision. I never heard of uglification, Alice ventured to say. What is it? The griffin lifted up both its paws in surprise. Never heard of uglification, it exclaimed. You know what to beautify is, I suppose. Yes, said Alice doubtfully. It means to make anything prettier? Well then, the griffin went on. If you don't know what to uglify is, you are a simpleton. Alice did not feel encouraged to say any more questions about it, so she turned to the mock turtle and said, What else had you to learn? Well, there was mystery, the mock turtle replied, counting off the subjects on his flappers. Mystery, ancient and modern, with seography, then drawling. Uh, the drawling master was an old conger eel that used to come once a week. He taught us drawling, stretching and uh, fainting in coils. What was that like? asked Alice. Well, I can't show it to you myself, the mock turtle said. I'm too stiff, and the griffin never learnt it. Hadn't time, said the griffin. I went to the classical master, though. He was an old crab, he was. I never went to him, the mock turtle said with a sigh. He taught laughing and grief, they used to say. So he did, so he did, said the griffin, sighing in his turn. And both creatures hid their faces in their paws, "'And how many hours a day did you do lessons?' said Alice in a hurry to change the subject. Ten hours the first day,' said the Mock Turtle, Nine the next, and so on.' "'What a curious plan!' exclaimed Alice. "'That's the reason they're called lessons,' the Griffin remarked, "'because they lessen from day to day.' This was quite a new idea to Alice, and she thought it over a little before she made her next remark. "'Then the eleventh day must have been a holiday.' "'Of course it was.' said the Mock Turtle. And how did you manage on the twelfth? Alice went on eagerly. That's enough about lessons, the Griffin interrupted in a very decided tone. Tell her something about the games now. Chapter 10 The Lobster Quadrille The Mock Turtle sighed deeply and drew the back of one flapper across his eyes. He looked at Alice and tried to speak, but for a moment or two sobs choked his voice. Same as if he had a bone in his throat, said the Griffin. 
and it set to work shaking him and punching him in the back. At last the Mock Turtle recovered his voice, and, with tears running down his cheeks, he went on again. "'You may not have lived much under the sea.' "'I haven't,' said Alice. "'And perhaps you were never even introduced to a lobster.' Alice began to say, "'I only tasted,' but checked herself hastily, and said, "'No, never.' "'So you can have no idea what a delightful thing a lobster quattrell is.' "'No, indeed,' said Alice. "'What sort of a dance is it?' "'Why,' said the griffin, "'you first form into a line along the seashore. Two lines,' cried the mock turtle, "'seals, turtles, salmon, and so on. "'Then, when you cleared all the jellyfish out of the way, "'That generally takes some time,' interrupted the griffin. "'You advance twice. "'Each with a lobster as a partner,' cried the griffin. "'Of course,' the mock turtle said. "'Advance twice, set to partners. "'Change lobster and retire in the same order,' continued the griffin. "'Then, you know,' the mock turtle went on, "'you throw the—' "'The lobsters!' shouted the griffin with a bound into the air. "'As far out to sea as you can. "'Swim after him, screamed the griffin. "'Turn a somersault in the sea!' cried the Mock Turtle, capering wildly about. "'Change lobsters again!' yelled the griffin at the top of his voice. "'Back to land again, and that's all the first figure!' said the Mock Turtle, suddenly dropping his voice. And the two creatures, who had been jumping about like mad things all this time, sat down again, very sadly and quietly, and looked at Alice. "'It must be a very pretty dance,' said Alice timidly. "'Would you like to see a little of it?' said the Mock Turtle. "'Very much indeed,' said Alice. "'Come, let's try the first figure,' said the Mock Turtle to the Griffin. "'We can do it without lobsters, you know. Which shall sing?' "'Oh, you sing,' said the Griffin. "'I've forgotten the words.' So they began solemnly dancing round and round Alice, every now and then treading on her toes when they passed too close, and waving their forepaws to mark the time, while the Mock Turtle sang this very slowly and sadly. Will you walk a little faster, said a whiting to a snail. There's a porpoise close behind us, and he's treading on my tail. See how eagerly the lobsters and the turtles all advance. They are waiting on the shingle. Will you come and join the dance? Will you, won't you, will you, won't you? Will you join the dance? Will you, won't you, will you, won't you? Won't you join the dance? You can really have no notion how delightful it will be when they take us up and throw us with the lobsters out to sea. But the snail replied too far, too far, and gave a look askance, said he thanked the whiting kindly, but he would not join the dance, would not, could not, would not, could not, would not join the dance, would not, could not, would not, could not, could not join the dance. What matters it? How far we go, his scaly friend replied. There's another shore, you know, upon the other side. The further off from England, the nearer is to France. Then turn not pale, beloved snail, but come and join the dance. Will you, won't you, will you, won't you? Will you join the dance? Will you, won't you, will you, won't you? Won't you join the dance? Thank you. It's a very interesting dance to watch, said Alice, feeling very glad that it was over at last. And I do so like that curious song about the whiting. Oh, as to the whiting, said the Mock Turtle, they... you've seen them, of course. Yes, said Alice. I've often seen them at Dint... She checked herself hastily. I don't know where Din may be, said the Mock Turtle, but if you've seen them so often, of course you know what they're like. I believe so, Alice replied thoughtfully. They have their tails in their mouths, and they're all over crumbs. You're wrong about the crumbs, said the Mock Turtle. Crumbs would all wash off in the sea, 
but they have their tails in their mouths, and the reason is... Here the Mock Turtle yawned and shut his eyes. "'Tell her about the reason and all that,' he said to the Griffin. "'The reason is,' said the Griffin, "'that they would go with the lobsters to the dance, "'so they got thrown out to the sea. "'So they had to fall a long way. "'So they got their tails fast in their mouths "'so they couldn't get them out again. "'That's all.' "'Thank you,' said Alice. "'It's very interesting. "'I never knew so much about a whiting before.' "'I can tell you more than that if you like.' said the griffin. Do you know why it's called a whiting? I never thought about it, said Alice. Why? It does the boots and shoes, the griffin replied very solemnly. Alice was thoroughly puzzled. Does the boots and shoes, she repeated in a wandering tone. Why, what are your shoes done with, said the griffin. I mean, what makes them so shiny? Alice looked down at them and considered a little before she gave her answer. They're done with blacking, I believe. Boots and shoes under the sea, the griffin went on in a deep voice, are done with whiting. Now you know. And what are they made of? Alice asked in a tone of great curiosity. Soles and eels, of course, the griffin replied rather impatiently. Any shrimp could have told you that. If I'd been the whiting, said Alice, whose thoughts were still running on the song, I'd have said to the porpoise... Keep back, please. We don't want you with us. They were obliged to have him with them, the Mock Turtle said. No wise fish would go anywhere without a porpoise. Wouldn't it really? said Alice in a tone of great surprise. Of course not, said the Mock Turtle. Why, if a fish came to me and told me he was going on a journey, I would say, with what porpoise? Don't you mean purpose, said Alice. I mean what I say. The Mock Turtle replied in an offended tone, and the Griffin added, Come, let's hear some of your adventures. I could tell you my adventures beginning from this morning, said Alice a little timidly, but it's no use going back to yesterday because I was a different person then. Explain all that, said the Mock Turtle. No, no, the adventures first, said the Griffin in an impatient tone. Explanations take such a dreadful time. So Alice began telling them her adventures from the time when she first saw the white rabbit. She was a little nervous about it. Just at first, the two creatures got so close to her, one on each side, and opened their eyes and mouths so very wide, but she gained courage as she went on. Her listeners were perfectly quiet till she got to the part about her repeating, You are old Father William, to the caterpillar, and the words all coming different. And then the mock turtle drew a long breath and said, "'That's very curious.' "'It's all about as curious as it could be,' said the griffin. "'It all came different,' the Mock Turtle repeated thoughtfully. "'I should like to hear her try and repeat something now. "'Tell her to begin.' "'He looked at the griffin as if he thought it had some kind of authority over Alice. "'Stand up and repeat. "'Tis the voice of the sluggard,' said the griffin. "'How the creatures order one about and make one repeat lessons?' thought Alice. I might just as well be at school at once. However, she got up and began to repeat it, but her head was so full of the lobster quadril that she hardly knew what she was saying, and the words came very queer indeed. "'Tis the voice of the lobster,' I heard him declare. "'You have baked me too brown. I must sugar my hair. As a duck with its eyelids, so he with his nose trims his belt and his buttons and turns out his toes.' When the sands are all dry, he is gay as a lark, and will talk in contemptuous tones of the shark. But, when the tide rises and sharks are around, his voice has a timid and tremulous sound. "'That's different from what I used to say when I was a child,' said the griffin. "'Well, I never heard it before,' said the mock turtle, "'but it sounds uncommon nonsense.' Alice said nothing. She had sat down with her face in her hands, "'wondering if anything would ever happen in a natural way again. "'I should like to have it explained,' said the Mock Turtle. "'She can't explain it,' said the Griffin hastily. "'Go on with the next verse.' "'But about his toes,' the Mock Turtle persisted. "'How could he turn them out with his nose, you know?' "'It's the first position in dancing,' Alice said, "'but she was dreadfully puzzled by the whole thing "'and longed to change the subject. "'Go on with the next verse.' the griffin repeated. It begins, I passed by his garden. Alice did not dare to disobey, 
though she felt sure it would all come wrong, and she went on in a trembling voice. I passed by his garden and marked with one eye how the owl and the panther were sharing a pie. The panther took pie crust and gravy and meat, while the owl had the dish as its share of the treat. When the pie was all finished, the owl, as a boon, was kindly permitted to pocket the spoon, while the panther received knife and fork with a growl and concluded the banquet by, "'What is the use of repeating all that stuff?' the mock turtle interrupted. "'If you don't explain it as you go on, it's by far the most confusing thing I ever heard.' "'Yes, I think you'd better leave off,' said the griffin, and Alice was only too glad to do so. "'Shall we try another figure of the lobster quattro?' the griffin went on. Or would you like the Mock Turtle to sing you another song? Oh, a song, please, if the Mock Turtle would be so kind, Alice replied, so eagerly that the Griffin said, in a rather offended tone, Ugh, no accounting for tastes. Sing a turtle soup, will you, old fellow? The Mock Turtle sighed deeply and began, in a voice choked with sobs, to sing this. Beautiful soup, so rich and green, Waiting in a hot tureen, who for such dainties would not stoop? Soup of the evening, beautiful soup. Soup of the evening, beautiful soup. Beautiful soup. Beautiful soup. Soup of the evening, beautiful, beautiful soup, beautiful soup, who cares for fish, game, or any other dish, who would not give all else for two pennies worth only of Beautiful soup, pennies worth only of beautiful soup, beautiful soup, beautiful soup, soup of the evening, beautiful, beautiful soup. Chorus again, cried the griffin, and the mock turtle had just begun to repeat it, when a cry of, The trial's beginning, was heard in the distance. Come on, cried the griffin, and taking Alice by the hand, it hurried off, without waiting for the end of the song. What trial is it? Alice panted as she ran, but the griffin only answered, Come on, while more and more faintly came, carried on the breeze that followed them, the melancholy words. Soup of the evening, beautiful, beautiful soup. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Tom Reads Books podcast. If you'd like to support the show, leaving a rating and a short review on whatever podcast platform you're using really goes a long way to help us reach new listeners. Other than that, I hope you have a wonderful day. Enjoy this snippet from the Patreon-exclusive book we're reading at the moment, and I look forward to reading to you again very soon. Pride and Prejudice Laugh as much as you choose, but you will not laugh me out of my opinion. My dearest Lizzie, do but consider in what a disgraceful light it places Mr. Darcy to be treating his father's favourite in such a manner, one whom his father had promised to provide for. It is impossible. No man of common humanity, no man who had any value for his character, could be capable of it. Can his most intimate friends be so excessively deceived in him? Oh, no. 
I can much more easily believe Mr. Bingley's being imposed on than that Mr. Wickham would invent such a history of himself as he gave me last night, names, faces, everything mentioned without ceremony. If it be not so, let Mr. Darcy contradict it. 